Good morning and welcome to PSJ Java Chat, your morning chat with your favorite PSJ ISD instructional technology integration specialist, where we discuss edtech tools and trends with invited guests and, of course, our morning coffee. In this, our third Java Chat episode, we talk with Escalante Middle School CIT, Joe Rodriguez. He shares with us his campus initiatives and how he supports teachers by showcasing how to integrate technology to obtain and maintain student attention and participation. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us with our Java Chat. Uh, today we have a special guest with us, Jose Rodriguez. He is one of our CITs here at PSJA at Escalante Middle School. And we're going to get to know him a little bit today and, and see how he uses technology at his campus and helps with technology at his campus. So we're so excited to be here. I'm Debbie Pingle and with me I have Valentin Guetta. We're integration specialists with the district. And Valentin and I work with elementary, but we also support, you know, the whole district. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So welcome, Joe. Thanks again welcome, for Joe. being here today. Thanks. Thank you for being our third guest uh, in our uh, um, Java Chats. I forgot what this one was called for a second. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many names, but uh, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Thank yeah, you so here. Joe, tell us about yourself and, and how you started at PSJ. Sure, so I was, I was actually a student in PSJ. Um, so that was kind of my first introduction to PSJ, right? Uh, so right after graduating college, I had two, uh, I had a job offer in, in Houston. And the same day that I got that offer, I got a call from Mr. Mondrell, who is a principal here, saying there's a potential opening. And I really wanted to coach uh, in the district. So that was the reason why I accepted both jobs, right? So I accepted both jobs and I showed up here on that first day. Uh, and I start, actually started off in the unit. So I started off with the life skills kids um so that was interesting um it was kind of like a weird situation so i started off in the life skills and the computer lab manager here at the campus um moved on to mis so they're like hey sir your your skills kind of better fit in this lab manager role so would you prefer to kind of hop into that position so i accepted it and um at that time we kind of had we had this grant called the campus redesign grant so before any other districts had new lines or all these other things happening, we had that stuff happening. So I got really good exposure to, you know, almost having a one-to-one -one campus because we had about 400 HPs and we had like 500 students, right? So we were almost one-to-one. -one. We had a new line in every um, class. We had three, we had all these resources. So it was great to kind of be involved with all of these things. So I enjoyed it and um, COVID happened. And, and, and when COVID happened, everything kind of shifted more into technology direction. So I stopped being viewed as like the guy that was like, help me fix this. And I started being viewed as like a balance of help me fix this. And also, how do I do this in Google Classroom? How do I do this in this platform? Whatever the case is. So fortunately, at that point, the CIT op role opened up here at this campus and uh, I applied and unfortunately got that. So since becoming the CIT here uh, last year, actually, um, I've just been finding the balance of doing both, you know, helping with the technical side of things and also helping with the instructional side of things, which is very valuable because everything is moving in the instructional direction <clears throat> with technology. Yeah, I, I really love that. You actually kind of went into the next question a lot, which which was really nice. But I did hear something about you went from being a computer lab manager to going into MIS with the, with the district as well. No, no, no. The the former lab manager here, Martin de la O. Oh, was, Martin went to, and then he yeah. gave you that position, and now you yep, became yep, yep. the king of of your campus. I love that. Yeah, it was interesting because he he was here. I had like two weeks to shadow him, and I remember uh, during that time everything was like things hadn't been installed yet. Like the new lines hadn't really been installed. The HPs were getting onboarded, so he was like, "I'm going to show you how to scan on DMAC, and I'm going to show you how to print posters and basic little like." troubleshooting things He's like, but everything else you're gonna have to figure it out on the spot so that was really interesting and funny because um as techs would come uh to like install or up on board certain devices or whatever they were learning as well because it was new to them as well so it was cool nice. to see everything kind of develop since the very beginning to where the district is now so a lot of other cits a lot of times when they have questions about um new lines or whatever the case is it's interesting because those are things that we were experiencing like 2018 so it, it's pretty cool to see that nice so i'm going to tweak the question the next question a little bit so it's asking you how did you get into technology which you kind of told us but i want us to tell them like what started gearing you into the 
love for technology and to more of a gadget guy because I can feel that uh, I, I, I sense some resonance with my likes of gadgets and playing around with cables and going around and fixing stuff with you as well. Yeah, so what got me into technology um, as a whole, really. Um, so I did athletics in, 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 in college, right? And a lot of what that entailed was dealing with technology. So we would measure like certain movements in meters per second. And I had never seen that before. And, and like certain film review sessions, things like that changed kind of the way I viewed the thing that I loved, right? So as I transitioned out of athletics and into the working field, right? I just viewed those same resources and those same tools in a different way. I said, how can I adapt these things to better take care of the things that I'm trying to do and all these other things, right? So technology is just a great resource for anything. I, I say this to my like lab manager or to people that I help here. And I say like, if you can think it, you can do it, technology. And that's really not something that's been able to happen 20 years ago. Like if you could think it, you could dream it and maybe eventually it could happen. But we're at that point now where like, if you have an idea, it's gonna. It, there's a way to fix it. And there's a way to do it. it. Doesn't matter what it is. So that's also very helpful for like when I talk to teachers and when I try to help teachers to implement things for instructional technology or in technology integration. It's like just give me your idea and I'll find something for you. And from there, I'll train you. And if you like it, great. And if not, we'll find something else. You know. So it's just the ability to overall kind of. Um, it's limitless on what you can do, right? So that's very interesting because there isn't a lot of like limitless resources in the world nowadays. Well, and it's here to stay. Like technology <laughs> is not going away. Um, yeah. You know, we we kind of need to guide our teachers to use more technology um, with their teaching because that's where our world is headed. You know, our, our kids need to know how to use it mm -hmm. and how to find those resources. But that kind of leads us into the next question as you were talking about, you know, helping the teachers. Um, share with us some of your experience about using technology for instructional purposes. Sure. So uh, in the past two years, in the past three years, really, there's been like a lot of shifts, right? One of them being COVID and this other one being uh, the star redesign. So both of those two things have been massive shifts in which it almost feels like everything's starting from zero again, right? A lot of teachers still kind of feel like, no, it's the, it's the same star or like, no, nah, it shouldn't be that different, things like that, right? Or now we're back from COVID, everything should go back to normal. But there's <laughs> still like a lot of adjustment for a lot of people, whether it's students, whether it's staff, whether it's teachers, admin, you know, there is a big shift and it is really like us starting from zero. So <clears throat> it's been helpful for me, um, kind of the way I think and kind of the way I approach things to just like use foresight to think like what needs and what issues are going to come up. So at the very beginning of the year, like there was two big issues that I saw. I saw there was an adjustment to coming back from COVID. I had teachers that were still logging into Google Classroom and having the kids turn on the Google Meet in classroom right which is kind of interesting like i'm not too sure why they do, maybe they're doing it because there's a kid sitting in the back that can't see who knows right there could be a hundred justifications for it but at the end of the day that may not be the most practical thing to do right so that was one big issue that i saw where it's like people were struggling to adjust to coming back from covid so there was this sense of we're going to continue google classroom google meet or we're going to go back to paper pencil right and then the second part of it which was a start redesign was looking at conversations happening in CLCs and kind of looking at curriculum and stuff, I saw that like there wasn't a lot of things that were preparing the teachers or the students kind of for what Star Redesign kind of was bringing. So um, I started asking questions because for all I knew, someone else was working on it already and there was no need for me to get involved. And then when I realized people weren't working on it, I said, you know what, let me come up with all of these solutions to see if it's even possible first, right? Unfortunately, it was, and it was possible, and it was free, which is the most important thing when I try to push to the teachers. Um, so then I, I reached out to Marco actually, and I said, "Hey, I have this thing right here. Let me know what you think." So from there, we kind of just ran with it. We got approval from multiple people to kind of like push it to our teachers, and that's been what we've been doing. We're kind of just trying to get them ahead of the game because at the end of the year, regardless of what happens, um, we want our teachers and our students to feel best prepared for whatever the outcome is. So if it's positive, great, you know, we were ahead of the game. And if it was negative, we tried everything that we possibly could try. And from there, we just look on to someone else to help us more. Yeah. I love how you stated that. Now I do have a little, that that, that caught my attention, the, the Google Classroom in, 
usage in the classroom. What exactly do you think? I'm like, because I'm like, the only thing that I can fathom that that could be is I want my students all to see everything that I'm going to be sharing and they're sharing their screen and maybe that could be it. Or was were you encountering different situations of why they will we still stuck with Google Classroom? Yeah, I've seen I've seen meet, multiple scenarios. Google Meet, not Google Classroom. Google Meet, yeah. There's been multiple scenarios, right? So I've seen the scenario in which a teacher brings their own personal iPad mm -hmm. and uh, they were having problems with uh, Display note, a new line cast, right? So they just use the meet in that way to show their annotations to the kids. I've seen that okay. scenario, which that scenario makes sense, but there's other workarounds, right? There's better workarounds because sometimes Google Meet is a little, doesn't look great whenever you're trying to annotate, right? So there's that side of it. I also saw the side lagging, of it where- Lagging with the internet, yes. Yeah, big that. time, it's a huge one, right? I've also seen the side of it where a teacher uses it just to record themselves. Okay while the classroom is going on to post it to the Google Classroom for kids that were absent or that want to refer back to it. And I've also seen it on the other side, which is like just turn on so that way if I step out and pop my head out, I could I could see you on my on my phone. I want to make sure everyone's there in class <laughs> or in case a kid is sitting in the back that can't really see, they see the notes okay. there. But I mean, you could always just move the kid to the front of the class. Or there's other there's always like basic things like that, right? But I've seen those three scenarios. Um, I'm sure there's other ones that are just not coming to my mind right now, but or, or yeah. could it be that they were just like, OK, I was just so used to at eight o'clock in the morning. I was in that's actually meet and yeah. everybody was in me and let's just get into me. That's actually very true as well, because that has come up because I've asked. I'm like, hey, like. Maybe let's just try something else, maybe like I'm sorry, like I'm just used to this routine. I'm just used to this routine and a lot of what the school is, is a lot of routine, right? So that's also one of the challenges of like getting teachers to kind of um, sometimes try new things because they're so used to. I've been doing this for so long, but that's been. If there's exactly. been one positive out of COVID, <laughs> it's people's willingness to try new things, right? Good. So yeah. I've kind of been able to try to really push the, the teachers here and, and staff as well to try new things um, as we're coming out of this kind of reset, right? Going back to what I mentioned earlier, like it's almost like a year zero is what it feels like. Cool. Thank you. So I guess, did we ask um, the different ways you support teachers with technology? I guess you really discussed that with us. You know, that was yeah. our next question. But sure, if you sure, have sure. anything else to add, I mean, you yeah. you know, you talked about it a, quite a bit. Sure. So uh, <laughs> at my campus, and, and each CIT has a different situation at their campus, right? But we're viewed through multiple lenses, through multiple people, right? Because we have the students, we have the parents, we have the teachers, we have the admin, and then we have the general staff, right? So sometimes, most of the time the students view us as like the on-campus tech they'd be like if my device is broken i'm having trouble with the wi-fi if any of those situations come up i'm gonna go talk to that guy the cit right so that's like the student view the parent view is similar the parent view is like if i have a fee because i damaged device or the kid damaged device something like that happens or i have problems with wi-fi at home because we also have the retro campus right so i get a lot of those calls about connectivity so we're viewed through that lens through our teachers lens at my campus specifically it's a similar situation in which they view me as this kind of hardware person that helps with laptops issues printer issues new line issues but at the same time there's down this other lens that it comes into play which is this instructional side which has been very helpful for questions like um how can i differentiate in class how can i find better resources digital resources to, to help my kids because we have a very high emerging bilingual population right so we have to find creative ways to get everyone involved and everyone to kind of understand things. So on the teacher side, there's there's that. And then on the admin side, you kind of just get thrown all of these projects, which is really cool because I, I enjoy that. I enjoy getting all of these projects that deal with testing or data or whatever the case is, kind of to help us continue to push ourselves forward. So um, fortunately, I, I'm in a situation where I'm allowed a one CLC per month. So typically what I'll do is I'll uh, send surveys out at least three times a year at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year, and I ask teachers what they feel their needs are. Do you feel like you're struggling with instructional programs? So like iStation 7K12, Imagine Math. Do you feel like you're struggling with the hardware side of things? Do you feel like you're struggling with finding things in Nearpod or finding things in different free resources, right, that kind of help the kids kind of be more involved and helps the teachers integrate technology more? And based off of those responses, I plan kind of the CLCs for the year as it progresses. And as we head into testing as well, as we head into Delpas, you know, we try to find more resources that help 
teachers kind of get the practice of kids <clears throat> like using like flip or using rewardify or using things that help the kids engage and also practice you know english talking writing listening speaking all that good stuff right um and as we get to the end of the year they're looking for more fun activities or like how can i just not go crazy and have the kids have a good time right and then at the very end of the year they get that chance to kind of recap their entire year and figure out what we need for next year so in that last month i pretty much start planning for september october november and that's been kind of the, the way i feel best helps teachers kind of continue to engage continue to learn and um helps them move forward hopefully do you um find any like tools that are more popular than others with teachers like technology um, websites or or programs yeah or yeah so there's a some some teach our science teachers really like vocabulary and the way i approach vocabulary okay. is a little different than uh the way it traditionally is presented because at the middle school high school level it's kind of like kids really don't like it so I, I approach it in reverse order i approach it from the end and say look you have all these things that you can do all these ways that you can use it and then at the very end you have this video and that has been more helpful for people to use but that's a helpful one um vr stuff is really helpful for our science and social studies group as well so the near pod or in youtube um those are both really good do you have sets for vr we don't but it lets the kids do the 3d view so that helps the kids kind okay. of just explore within that range um recently we started using ted ed ted ed has been pretty popular mm -hmm. as well it's a free thing and it's kind of like animated it's tailored towards kids and it has this preset kind of projects within it as well which has been helpful um but those are like the big three things that provide stimulus for kids through either video or audio and also provides them a preset um assignment those are tend to be the most popular things for teachers just because i know they have things that they have to do on their end go mm -hmm. ahead i feel like you have a question Valentine. yeah so like it, with like the arvr i just want to ask you what kind of teachers what subjects do you think that will entice more to grab them so i'm thinking science maybe maybe even social studies more than yeah. than than language arts or yeah both of, both of those for sure um language arts it depends on what they're covering at what time right so if they're talking about like setting or something yeah it just depends on, on the time of the year versus in science of studies social studies it is a little easier because most of the stuff is already created if you're talking about tangible specific region <laughs> yeah exactly so it makes life a little easier for them so the challenge yeah. has been like especially for me for math it's hard to get like in those same scenarios to get math involved so for math in order to get that student engagement we they, we try to push them to use things like QR codes, kind of the way y'all had that flip okay. thing mm -hmm. over there in, in region one. For math, it's more so doing those type of activities that provide student engagement, gets the kids to get up or kind of to experience things from their real world, right? Because it's hard to find like a VR video specific to math in the real world that can relate to the kids, especially the population that we have. So it's just trying to think outside the box. And a lot of times what I tell the teachers is, I provide you the I could provide you the resources and the tool. And a lot of the teachers are going to want to run with it and figure out their own thing. Some teachers are going to try and they're going to be like, you know what, it's not for me. And that's OK. But there's some teachers that say, hey, it's plan with me, figure out how I can use this because I don't know how to use it. and I don't know how to think about I love it. That. So they're kind of like the. The master of, of kind of the topic, I'm just there trying to guide them how to use the resource. And that's really ultimately when it works best because you get their creativity and their ideas and you just help make sure that it works and that tends to be the best situation for me that's honestly when i like it the most so there's like about four teachers here that i work with like i meet with once a week and, and try to do those things and the rest of the teachers i meet sporadically I, we schedule it or clcu after school whatever the case is but <clears throat> typically when you have that collaboration between the person that is creating their own information and the person that's helping guide that's typically when it works the best for us. Cool. Great. So how has technology changed your view and your personal time? My view and my personal time. So early on, like in COVID, um, I would just turn off my phone. I, like when work day ended, I'd turn off my phone because my phone, there's multiple times where my phone would just restart because I would be getting like Teams, text, <laughs> calls, all this stuff. So early on, uh like a year or two ago i would just turn off my phone because i had had enough of it so during the day it was get whatever i needed to get done done and then i had to take a break from it 
so recently I've I've started to use it more just because part of, of, of what I feel my job is is to stay ahead of the game and research and find what's going to come next because fortunately we've been able to be caught up and kind of ahead of the game up until now so I'm thinking about 2025 2026 right what is life going to be like then and what's going to be happening in the classroom so although it was good to have a break because we had caught up and we kind of were ahead of the game now we've kind of caught up with time time's caught up with us actually so right now is just trying to find things for the future we got this ai stuff coming out that's a challenge is going to be a challenge for sure because it, what are the implications for teachers and for students right so it's kind of staying ahead of the game and trying to find creative ways to continue to make sure that we stay ahead of the game so uh i spend more time on technology now whether it be for, for the job or for coaching or just my personal time um of just finding things that are going to be engaging creative and hopefully fun right because at the end of the day like entertainment for myself also is important and technology is such a huge way to do that yeah yeah that's an interesting perspective on looking at things and then going back on that just pushing it back from your personal time back into the classroom what has been most of the things that you're like this is why i want to help teachers with tech in their classroom like i want to do this because it's going to help do what yeah so so i grew up in in, in this area as well in, in the south area so if this galante existed when i was uh in middle school i would have came to this school so i remember being in school and being very disengaged I, I was a pretty intelligent kid, but I remember being so bored in class that I would often like I would finish my work within like the first 15 minutes of class and I just sit there the rest of the time just be bored. Right. So me as a kid, I know that I, I would have loved to have all of the stimulus that keeps me engaged and keeps things fun. And I feel like if I was a kid again and I had all of these things. I would feel that I could do whatever job i'd like to do in the future back then you were kind of limited to like you're going to be a doctor you're going to be an engineer. like you're pushed to like the big <laughs> medical fields or like the engineering field or like the lawyer right and other than that it's about it now the options are endless like you could be whatever you'd like to be if you want to do with software you could do that and if you want to do software there's so many things that you could do within software if you want to do you want to be a youtuber right if you want to do that you can do that <laughs> an like, influencer yeah exactly. and you can start, and, like, there's kids with like youtube channels and yeah. stuff and, and it's cool because it's like you're doing what you feel you can do and the great thing is that you can do it now right so the reason why i feel like pushing the teachers to help with technology integration is because it helps the kids kind of view world through a different lens right because typically like you really don't get the opportunity at the age of 13, 14 to kind of like have purchases of technology, but each of them have a laptop now. So that's like a, a crazy resource that they have to, at their disposal and, and they can now do whatever they like. They could research whatever they like, whatever they're interested in. And that's a good thing and a bad thing sometimes, right? Because <laughs> you can research great things or you can research poor things. But at the end of the day, your future is now in your hands at a younger age versus back then I had to wait till I was a junior in, in high school to have a phone, you know, so I had waited a long time to have a phone and that was just because of, of, of my family situation. Right. But back then. I really didn't know what I wanted to do until I was a freshman in college. And that's a long time. The kids could start figuring that stuff out now, which is great. And it's better to help figure that stuff out through positive engagement with technology versus like just being paper pencil doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind so of crazy bigger. how we re how we rely on our technology nowadays too in our day to day life. Yep. It was uh, I'm gonna share something. I mean, it was like last month that um, I lost my phone, and it for that moment of time, not being able to make contact for anyone, access access my stuff because I had to double authenticate, secondary authenticate to be able to access my Google and all that stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. We get lost without it. Yes. <laughs> When I was a kid, Joe, there wasn't even a, a side of a cell phone. <laughs> so yeah. times have definitely yeah. changed. Yeah. Uh. And part of it is also finding that balance. Uh, that's something that uh, I work with my dean of instruction. We're doing some action research on what the appropriate balance is of technology use in the classroom. Uh, because oh, yeah. at the same time, you don't want to become extremely reliant on it. Like if, if you need your phone or you need a, a laptop, or whatever, to do all of your work, 
and you can't really have that creativity of your own or know how to write, you know, those are also problems as well. So that's yeah, part of the 100%. challenge that you all are facing and the CITs at the local level, right? Which is finding that balance that keeps kids engaged, but also doesn't take away and hurt their future because we're like at this weird crossroads, right? Where technology is either going to really, really take off or it's going to kind of stay the same and, and progressively increase. So it's going to be interesting to see in the next five years what technology does for us. Definitely. So thank you, Joe, for all that insight. What has been your proudest moment in utilizing technology? Yeah, so uh, there's there's these handful of teachers that I've been working with, and they range from all age ranges. They range from on on the 50 side to the 22 year old side, right? So these five teachers that I was really closely working with all had similar issues in which they struggled to implement technology into their classrooms. Um, they didn't feel comfortable with it. And it was crazy to see that age range because you would imagine the 22 year old was fairly comfortable that like they've had it much of their life. They should, but they were like, nope, I learned it like this in class. I learned it under a document camera or a projector, and this is the way I feel comfortable teaching it. Right. And then you have also on the 50s, 60 years old side where they've been doing it like that for 30 years, longer than I've been alive, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I'm here telling them like, hey, you got to try new things. Right. So. When I started working closely with them and started showing them. Things can get easier and faster and more efficient for you. That was really the selling point because the big the big concern and the big gripe often is I don't have enough time mm -hmm. from from all the teachers, right? Mm -hmm. But helping them understand that. Once you get comfortable, it will take a lot less time, right? So with these specific five teachers, it's just been an ongoing project. And the first two weeks was hard because those first two weeks like nope. Sorry, like it, it didn't work like the, the we had a wireless issue that the first week and they're like, no, I'm done. Like, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be part of this. And I'm like, just trust me, like it's rare that this happens to so just continue to try. So by week four, a month in, they became extremely comfortable with it. Their planning time started going down. They used to leave here like at 7 p.m. After that first month, they started living here like at four. Wow. Like, hey, there you go. Look, you're saving three hours after school. Like, go nice. with your family. Go that's a lot home. of time being saved. Yeah. So <laughs> that's been really happy for me to see, like, others noticing and Adam noticing, like, this person was here till seven for the past year. And all of a sudden, like, their class is moving pretty well, they're pretty efficient. They're getting that integration up more and their planning is changing. Yeah, that's been very helpful. Um, just with auto grading, when you have something that grades the stuff that you ask your students questions, that will help you a lot of time if you don't have to actually grade it yourself too. Yeah, and it also eliminates that whole like the waiting process for printing. There's times I would see there and they'd just be there for 30 minutes. Oh. You print package, package, package. And just put it in a PDF, put a form, whatever you're gonna do, put it in Google Classroom and send it a few times and you're good. <laughs> Not talking about the environment. We're saving trees. Yeah. We're saving trees. Yeah. You're talking yeah. to a dude that drives a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. So lastly, we want to ask you. In your role and your campus, what are some ways that us as a department can do more to support you to do the amazing things that you're doing? Because we hear everything that you're doing. We see everything that you're doing. You're like the CIT and secondary that integrates technology and does trainings and brings the people together and get and gets your teachers excited about it. I'm like, we see it in you. You've done trainings for us and that makes us, how can we better support you to continue to do that? Yeah, so I think um, I, I've been very fortunate because uh, I've got a good relationship with our administrators and stuff. So that's been very helpful. I think the way that the department can better help the CIT role as, as a whole, not specific to just me, right? But as a whole is um, a lot of times people get tired or bored of hearing the same thing or the same thing from the same person. Right? Okay. So it's helpful often to get the perspective of someone else because although I may be explaining the same thing, people won't get it. It doesn't matter if I say it. 10 different ways. Multiple at intelligences. The someone else I, I get it. Comes in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it happens to everyone at every level, right? So sometimes getting the perspective or the words from someone else 
is helpful to teachers to keep the teachers excited right so i think uh the most helpful way i think it's great uh that we you all have the unmute and recharges and you can do all of these wonderful things um the challenge i'm sure that you face is attendance so i think that the helpful <laughs> thing would be like partnering and getting into those clcs right so uh, marco does a pretty good job here with me and i invite marco quite often say hey but if you want to come i'm doing this clc here's my presentation if you have anything to add on or anything hop onto it like, awesome. you're welcome right so i think as a role as a whole for the cits I think it's helpful to do those type of things, those little partnerships, because your perspective is also extremely valuable because you see things through a different light and you come from different experiences, right? My experience and my background was uh, organizational leadership. So I never taught, I haven't taught. So whenever I approach teachers, it's really from that role of, here's this tool, here's this resource. Um, your creativity is gonna take you where it's gonna take you versus you guys have that experience of, here's this tool, here's this resource, and here's this teaching background as well. Uh, Jose, I, works well. I, I, if you don't have the teaching background, I can tell you, like, I can hear your lingo and your speaking. You have experience in pedagogy. Um, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're the only CIT that knows that emergent bilinguals is a new term for <laughs> for the students that, that were born with speaking yeah. Spanish. So I was yeah. surprised when you're like, the emergent bilinguals. I was like, whoa, yeah, dude, it's a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You put in the work for your campus, and yeah. I'm sure everybody at your campus appreciates all that you do for them. But yeah, ultimately, I think uh, that would help a lot of campuses out, uh, that collaboration between the CIT and, and the department. Nice. Yeah. I like that. So, like, to just do hearing from different perspectives, I, I really like that feedback. That's really That's cool. That's helpful, yeah. And, and, and that helps also, it helps the perspective of everyone, right? I'm sure that. I know for sure I would get something out of talking to each of you, and I, and I hope that you all would get something out of me as well. In the same role, same thing across the, the board, you know, with other CITs. But well, we're always here for you. You can always reach to any of us. Yeah, yeah. any of us, <laughs> anytime. Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we don't turn off our phones after work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. They do stay but on. But some of but... us do lose it. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we appreciate your time with us, Tajo. You're doing amazing things for your campus. And um, hopefully some other listeners will, you know, take some of your advice that you gave today and, you know, work on helping their campuses as well. And it was great spending time with you this morning. I really appreciate you taking the time to do our Java chat with us. We, me and Debbie do have our little coffees. This coffee mug was given to me by, by Debbie. Um, <laughs> and um, that that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to add? No, just thank you for all your help. And you know, y'all are doing a great job. You have a tough role because I think it's four of you for loads of campuses. So <laughs> y'all doing a phenomenal job of pushing, you know, trainings. And ultimately, without trainings, how can we all improve? You know, that's really what it comes down to. So, great job, and thank you for all your help. Thank you for saying. I'm gonna stop the recording now. All right. Thanks, Joe.